I'll tell you, sometimes I just love listening to kids' explanations on things and their stories and the simplicity of, of uh, what they have to say. And I also like hearing John laugh, too. So that's a, that's a good way to start the morning. So, All right, we are nearly a month into our journey through the Bible. How's it going for you? I pray that God is bringing you encouragement through his word and through one another. Okay, I want to just again maybe challenge you in this way that if you are reading through the Bible on your own, uh, encourage someone to join you, whether it be in conversation again each week on the back of your, uh, your sermon outline. There are some questions that I've put together that you could use uh, to help maybe guide some of the conversation. But we grow together by gathering together. We don't grow together by being apart. Now, before we dive into this week's focus, let's review a few of the highlights. Okay, Remember, first, God created the perfect universe, and he designed man to be in a perfect relationship with him, under his loving authority. But Satan enticed Adam and Eve into sin, leading them to believe that God's leadership ought not to be trusted. That they would be better off if they just decided who, who and what was right and wrong. What, that they be in control rather than God. As this insurrection of God's leadership unfolded, sin entered the world and death became a reality for everyone. All living creatures. To add insult to this injury, we said, not only were we affected through death, but everything in creation has been tainted by the effects of sin. The very most important question that you will answer, if you have not already, in this lifetime is, who is your leader? In other words, who are you following? Because who or what the answer is to that question will dictate where your life is going. Now, the world was very resistant to God's leading, which resulted in great wickedness. We saw back in Genesis that God saw the, how great the wickedness was in the human race, and that every inclination of the heart was evil all the time. And so the wickedness led to the great restart, which was through Noah and his family, God wiping off humanity because of the sinfulness. Remember last week that I said God had every right to just wipe everything and just be done with it. Now I want you to think back, if you've had kids uh, to that time, and, and ask yourself, uh, when your kids chose to uh, resist your authority, so you had something in mind that you felt like was best for them to do, how did you respond to that? We'll, we'll use the word, again, I'll use the, the word, maybe, maybe you wouldn't call it an insurrection, but they are, they are trying to attack your leadership in the home. Well, I would say that history shows first of all in our world, that the, the natural tendency that when, when something arises, the, the best response that we tend to come up with, or the first response, is to squelch it. We use force and just put it, put it down. And this reflects itself often in how we parent. I think about you know, if, if the story that I, that I came across this week about, imagine if you had a teenager... And they came up to you one day and they said, you know what, Mom and Dad, from now on, I'm going to go and do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it. Uh, you're not going to tell me what to do. We've got a couple probably experts maybe that could speak to that. But, <laughs> but, but the response is likely not going to be, oh, okay, no big deal. Thanks for just letting us know. You know, just do whatever you want to do. Okay, most likely you're going to respond with something either forceful in words, or maybe you'll, you'll discipline them and say, you're grounded until you're 40. You know, so that's, that, that is the response with which we tend 
to be. And yet God responds to our resistance not with force, but by laying down his life and paying for our sins, dying on the cross in great humility. Now last week we looked at the story of Joseph and we were reminded that that the things in our lives that are often uh, meant for evil, God often will turn those for good. God, God longs to, to or God works through the things in our lives for our good. So whatever trial or tribulation that you're facing today, do you see how God could use it for good? I think oftentimes it's hard to see that. Because otherwise it probably wouldn't be much of a trial. We would just know what was coming. But it's because and through those that we need to move closer to God in those instances. We need to value God and his word even more in those times rather than trying to avoid trials. We want to run away from them most of the time, don't we? We want to get, get as far away from any hurt and pain and trial and, and, and tough things that life will throw at us. But they're going to come, whether we flee or not. So this, mo- this morning, we are going to now take an exodus out of the book of Genesis and find ourselves entering one of the greatest stories ever told. Now many refer to this Old Testament story, this exodus, as the great escape. And it was a great escape. But as was said also in the video this morning, I think of it as it is the great rescue. In many ways, this story of the Exodus defines the Israelite time more than any other story. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, and through much of the Gospels, and even through Paul's writings, there are a ton of references back to the Exodus. So, buckle up and enjoy the journey this morning. Uh, If you're not familiar with how I tend to kind of structure my messages at this point, I like to have a summary statement early on, so that if you go out and share with someone uh, what you learned about, what the focus was on, this is the statement you can say, because I know the human brain. Uh, You're going to forget some of the things I say. That's just how we operate, even if we want to try our hardest to get it all. So here's a, a sentence that you can take with you. Humble submission is the only right response from those who entrust their lives to God's loving leadership. Now the book of Exodus is, begins with some very important context. So I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. It'll be up here on the screen. We read, And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased in numbers, excuse me, greatly, and multiplied, becoming exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt, Catch this part. Who did not know Joseph? And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Otherwise they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. Pharaoh has become fearful, and what we see is a human response. My first point this morning is this, that God's power rules over the natural world, but man's heart is hard. See, when fear runs your life and survival becomes your focus, it leads to some very irrational behaviors. We begin to act in inconsistent manners. 
anxiety is the great equalizer. One of the effects of anxiety, when it shows itself, is that it reveals who you truly are and what guides your life. You see, when you are in an anxious enough state, the masks that we attempt to wear fall away. If we do not submit our fears to God, our fears magnify, and fear begets division and separation. So Pharaoh decides that it is in his best interest and for the Egyptians to deal shrewdly with them. So I asked the question, for what purpose and why now? You see, we read that Pharaoh was concerned that the Israelites, that if they continue to grow, they would join with their enemies and eventually leave the country. Now, apparently, little thought was given to the fact that the Israelites had lived quite contentedly there in that country for many years. But the anxiety that Pharaoh was feeling led to concern. He thought that he would lose the power over these individuals and it might affect his position. So rather than looking back at history and, and also trying to strengthen the relationship with these people, he decided it's best to enslave them with hard labor. Yet, through this greater affliction, what we read is that the multiplication of the Israelites went even faster. The Egyptians now begin to dread them. So, Pharaoh says, well, let's deal with them in an even crueler way. So now we read, he began using the Israelites ruthlessly in hard labor. When that failed, his next step was to try to enforce mass genocide on all the male Israel, all of the newborn Israelite sons. You see, Pharaoh's heart was hardened towards God's people. Yet through this beginning to the story, we see very clearly that God is working through the Egyptian midwives and even Pharaoh's own daughter to undermine her dad's authority and bring Moses into palace living. Now, let's skip ahead a little bit in the story here for a minute to the moment when Moses returns back to Egypt. So again, just a quick reminder that he... he uh, eventually uh, flees Egypt, goes out, spends 40 years out in the wilderness. So after that time, so we're skipping ahead to when he's now coming back. I mean, there's a whole load of events that have taken place. So if you didn't read that part, go back and read it. There's a lot there. But God uses miraculous signs and plagues throughout the entire land of Egypt. He reveals that he has power over every aspect of the natural world. I can't even seem to have the power to remember to turn on the Zoom on time. <laughs> so, he has power over everything, and it is absolutely crystal clear through all of the plagues that we see. And yet, we see power even deeper in the fact that there is a part that's unaffected, and it's the part where the Israelite people live. And yet, even in the face of this incomprehensible level of evidence right in their face, the very wonders of God's power, we read, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God reveals himself through creation, and how he works in our world. Yet because of our modern view of science, we often believe that everything that is true is discernible 
through our senses. You see, the world teaches us to distrust that which is scientific, that which the world says is scientifically impossible. Does God still perform miracles? Does he still have power over all creation? Or doesn't he? Being led by the flesh only makes our hearts hardened. Being led by the Spirit allows us to be pardoned. So we know that God has power over everything in the natural world. So why do we worry? Well, let's move to the second point. God's power provides for our needs. But man is not satisfied. Now consider everything that the Israelites, put yourself in the shoes or the the sandals or the bare feet, whatever you want to have on for the journey, uh, that they encountered during the Exodus. Okay, here's a quick snapshot. They witnessed God bringing back Moses to to represent his people. They They saw the miraculous plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, God providing water from a rock, manna from heaven that would sustain them. Daily, the exact daily provision they needed. Then the water again. And I've read through these, this story many times, but every time I read through it again, and I read a piece of this, I think, surely this time now they will get it. Surely now after all of these signs and wonders, now they will trust and obey and know who is the Lord. Yet, as we take this flyover view of the Exodus, we see the exact opposite. Okay, I already said this, but when Pharaoh or when Moses comes back, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And Pharaoh takes it out on his on the Israelite people. He makes them work infinitely harder. Surely God's people will respond better, right? They know how to respond when God works. Well, that's not what Exodus seems to indicate. It says that the response from the people when hardship arose was to grumble at Moses. Wishing, and this is, this is the part that just grabs my eyes every time I read it. Wishing he had never come back. How many times in what we read do they say, if you would have just left us in Egypt, at least we would have had food. Or at least we would have had, uh, we would have had somewhere comfortable to sleep. Because they were focused on the increase in their toil. Now after witnessing all the plagues, The Israelites reach the bank of the Red Sea. So I've taken us back in the story a bit again here. Now they're trapped between Pharaoh's troops and the water. We pick it up in Exodus chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. It says, the people complain, saying, Is it because because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Even after all that they've witnessed at this point, the fear overtakes them and makes them believe that they were better off enslaved. And then, perhaps the most miraculous thing of them all and and that we we tend to focus on is the waters being parted. And the entire Egyptian army killed. I've seen this story play out in books, and not this specific story, but I've seen a great story put together, and this should be the climax of the story. Everything should be going smoothly after this. Yet just three days later, having not been able to find 
drinking water, the people grumble. God had Moses throw a stick into bitter water, and it became sweet. Then God made a decree, if you will listen carefully to my voice and do what is right in my sight and listen to my commandments and keep all my statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, am your healer. What a promise that is. Who would pass that up? I mean, imagine if, you know, the illnesses and things that we see around it, if God said, if you would just obey my commands, I won't, I, you won't have to deal with this stuff. I imagine at least initially, be like, sign me up for that. But, a short time later, the Israelites are again grumbling against Moses and Aaron. This time because of a shortage of food. They say, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. Now, now they're, they, they're cool with dying. That's fine. Let, let us just have died back there. Where at least we sat by pots of meat. When we ate bread until we were full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this entire assembly with hunger. But then God then provides them with daily manna. With very specific instructions about how to collect it. They are to go out and get a single portion, exactly what they need for that day, and no more. They are to eat it that night. Don't wait, because it will go bad. Only on preparation day, Friday, the day before the Sabbath, they are told to collect a double portion. And there's always plenty. God gives the people exactly what they need, and still they don't trust him. Still they disobey them. We see in there, it talks about people trying to keep some of the food for the next day, and sure enough, it was no good. You see people that on the first Sabbath day, they're out looking for food. There wasn't anything there. Shocker. Then we have a second instance of the shortage of water. And they grumble again. Which leads God to, to uh, cause Moses to, to strike the rock and uh, release more water. What an incredible series of events. And what an unbelievably hard-hearted, obstinate people who are quick to forget who was leading them. Remember last week, we saw that through the trials that Joseph faced, he was found to be a faithful follower of Jesus. And God blessed him because of it. He gave him more and more responsibility. Today we see the opposite. We see a group of people who time and time again prove they are unreliable. They waver in the wind, forgetful and distrustful, in spite of everything, all of the signs, all of the blessings God has given them. But don't be too quick to believe you know better or that you are any better. It never ceases to amaze me how short our memories are and how easy we are how easily it is for us to grumble when our desires are not met in the way we want them to be met or in the time frame when we want them to be met. So here's the important question from this section of the message, and it's this. Do the trials in your life, either those from the past that you can look back on or the trials that you find yourself in the midst of now, do they drive you closer to the Lord or do they cause you to grumble? Lord, help us to live more like Joseph. 
Because when we are led by the flesh, that leads to greed. But when we are led by the Spirit, it feeds our needs. And finally, God's power provides a way for us to overcome the world. Yet man goes his own way. Now let's skip ahead now in this portion to the New Testament. As was said in the video, and you're going to hear me say this, it is vital that we look at the Old and New Testament together. They are two parts of the same story. The New Testament helps us to understand so much of the Old Testament, just as the Old Testament helps us understand the New Testament. So we need to read the Bible as one big story, understanding the connections between the two. So God's great rescue plan that we just talked a little bit about that you read this week of the Exodus, it's pointing, it was pointing to the ultimate rescue plan that God had for us. Salvation in our lives for everyone who should choose to live under Christ's authority. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. He has triumphed over Satan and over all sin, over death and judgment, so that we may have peace. Yet Jesus also says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. For many, choosing the world's approach to life is attractive. And we read quite clearly here that it will be chosen by the majority. Yet we must be counted among the few. In Romans chapter 1, we see the bird's eye view of what happens to people who choose to deny God and his rightful authority in our lives. We have two options. We can be like the world, be quick to forget all that God has done. And just like the Israelites did, to actually be to actually prefer to be enslaved to the flesh. Think about that for just a minute. What you're doing when you ignore God or even in the moments in your life where you when you sin, you're, you're ultimately saying, I prefer, at least in this area of my life, to be enslaved to the flesh. I don't have to know everything about you. Um, all I need to know is that you're human. To know, just like myself, that we prefer, uh, we prefer a, a sense of comfort. We prefer stability whenever possible. Even if the stability is destructive. There are examples that are littered in our lives where we're more than happy to accept stability even if it enslaves us to something other than what God desires. The second option, which is the option I hope that we are all after, we are all doing about is that we are intentional about remembering and sharing both big and small things that God has done for us. That right there is why we do what we do during the testimony time. If for nothing else than but to remember something, remember what God has done. Maybe the person who needs to hear your testimony is yourself. You just need to verbalize it. It is the narrow gate because it, recognize, it, it causes us to need to humbly recognize our needs to daily die to our sins and to carry our cross daily. The Heidelberg Catechism states this in response to the question, what is a Christian's only comfort in life and death? And it is, this is the answer. That I am not my own 
but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that throughout the will of my Heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things work together for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. So are you led by the flesh, or are you led by the Spirit? Being led by the flesh reveals to sin we are still enslaved. Being led by the Spirit reveals that we have been saved. We grumble because God doesn't work in our timing. We grumble because God doesn't work in our wants. We grumble because He doesn't work in our methods. I'll close with this. And I pray that this will be an encouragement after what you listen to. An encouragement to continue reading the Old Testament. Now, earlier this week, I had a conversation with someone, and they asked me this question. How do you stay positive when reading through the Old Testament? I understood the question, because when it stands alone, it doesn't leave us with much hope. But when you, when you bring into the picture the New Testament, it provides the rest of the story and how God is at work throughout all of human history. One of the things that I love about God is that he is a God of irony. He tends to use events that actually took place in Israel to point towards some spiritual greater truth that would be revealed in the church age. For example, the story of Abraham almost sacrificing his son was pointing towards God providing Jesus, his son, as a sacrifice. The rescue plan that God used through the Exodus is pointing towards God's ultimate spiritual rescue plan. And it occurred at Calvary almost 2,000 years ago. Have you, take, have you taken him up on that offer? Because I'll tell you what, he is an amazing God to serve. And so we are reminded that humble submission is the only right response from those who entrust their lives to God's loving leadership. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the fact that uh, people took the time uh, by inspiration through you to write down such a powerful story as this. And Lord, that we are able to clearly see through something like the Exodus. Who's, who's in control? I'm so, I'm so thankful in stories like this that you, you very clearly reveal that it is not of uh, Moses' abilities or strength, um, but it is through you. Lord, you, use, you choose to use people uh, just like us, ordinary, everyday people, in order to grow your kingdom. Help us again, as always, to do our part. And I'm so thankful for each person uh, that is here, in, uh, either physically or uh, through Zoom. Lord, use us in this time. Help us to, to be faithful in our own growth, but also in the growth of those around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction, and we will have one final song.
May the peace of Christ be with you now and forevermore. Amen. And remember, church, we are sent.